Attention, citizens of Florida. Broadcasting from Carbondale in Southern Illinois' premier comic shop. And now your host, superlative shaman of comic book knowledge, Dan Brown. Flash the match signal in case of emergency for your host with the most on his mind, Matt Morton. Watch out, criminals. There's nothing funny to him about truth, justice, and the American way. It's Commander Harris himself, Scott Reed. And tuning in from the far reaches of no man's land, the mad scientist dream leader, Mike Ho. This is Campus Comics Cast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the Campus Comics Cast. Uh, we're going to be talking about a few different things this time, but uh, just to get started, this is Dan Brown, and I'm joined this time by Scott Reed and Mike Atchison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had to unmute his mic. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you know, we're still uh, recording via the internet. You know, everybody's kind of separated right now. We're maintaining quite a bit of social distance here with everybody. Uh, we don't have to talk through masks when we get together, so we're yeah, just yeah. Like, that'll be that'll be great for the audio. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so just starting off, letting everybody know, you know, about you know this is you know for the Campus Comics Store, so we are located at 816 East Main Street in Carbondale. Six one eight four five seven six zero one one is the number, and you can find us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, we are reopened, you know, been a lot of craziness going on for everybody last couple months. Uh, but you know, we do have the store open again right now. And, uh, we just ask that everybody wears masks when you come in. Uh, that's, you know, something from the city and just try to keep everybody safe. We, you know, do have some vulnerable people that come into the store and that kind of thing. So just, you know, try to be considerate of everybody with that. Uh, and, you know, there's been some other crazy stuff going on and, you know, books are shipping again now, kind of yes. slowly but surely they're coming in. Um, there's been all kinds of craziness with distribution. I mean, I'm sure, you know, everybody's kind of heard this by now, but just in case, just let everybody know where we're at with all that. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of change going on right now. Uh, just announced a few days ago that DC is leaving Diamond Distributors after, what, 25? 25, 25 years, I think. You know, so it's been a while since we've had a big upheaval in distribution like this. Um, so, yeah, so just, you know, main thing is just kind of bear with us during this time. You know, as we get everything sorted out, we're going to have to start going through two distributors now as opposed to one. Uh, it's some, you know, companies that are new to distribution on this scale. So there's probably going to be some hiccups. Um, you know, the store just in general is already phasing out kind of shelf books. So we're kind of just focusing on, you know, people's pull lists right now. So if there's something you want, definitely let us know, you know, come in ahead of time. We have, you know, there's the previews catalog. There will be a digital catalog for DC that you can go through. And there's always, you know, there's always a, a store copy of the previews catalog at the store. If you just want to flip through it real quick and let us know. But yeah, that's just really important right now, kind of going forward. The Marvel and the DC catalogs are both available for free online as well. Yeah. So now the big book is not free online, but the but the uh, Marvel and DC catalogs are at least currently they are. Right. So <laughs> I, think, I think DC plans on kind of expanding theirs, probably maybe doing some interactive stuff with it. I don't know what all, but again, that's all kind of up in the air right now. Uh, but yeah, so kind of big change coming for everybody. At probably not the best time for everybody because, you yeah. know, stores are reopening and things are, you know, kind of weird for everyone. You know, not everybody's back to work yet. Some people are, you know, some people have been, you know, but, you know, a lot of stores aren't doing great right now. And, you know, there's <laughs> a lot to throw on retailers, too. I mean, it's a lot for customers. And again, it's not their responsibility to know all this stuff. Yeah. But, you know, it helps. And, you know, it makes sure that we get your books for you. You know, if you let us know ahead of time like that. And like the uh, the change is uh, from the dates that I'm reading, like it's uh, taking effect next week, right? June fifteenth. It's like the final order cutoff. Yeah, but for DC books from Diamond, Diamond. right? From Diamond, and then it's going to have to be from another distributor at that point. Yeah, because I, I think it's I want to say the thirtieth, maybe. I don't think there's anything shipping that week. I think that might end up being a skip week or something. 
Okay. And so I think after that, we'll start getting um, DC books from Lunar or UCS is the other distributor. So I'm pretty sure the store is going with Lunar again. Not that that matters to anybody. No. <laughs> but just, you know, just sort of a weird thing. We haven't had anything like this since the 90s when Marvel, you know, in their whole Heroes World fiasco. Right. So, again, where, you know, we just had things shake out where at the end of the end of it, there's only one distributor. And this this has created some concern for some comic book shops. Because even though these names, Lunar and UCS, are new names, right. uh, they are, in fact, actually comic book shops yeah. that have just created a distribution arm. So one of them is uh, DCBS, and the yeah. other one is... Mid- Lunar, is Lunar is DCBS, and uh, UCS, UCS is Midtown Comics. Midtown Comics, which is in based in New York, right? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, most people have heard of these stores. You know, They mm-hmm. advertise pretty heavily online, and different things like that. So that's where the comics are coming from. A lot of people are ta- a lot of retailers are taking issue with these big stores now having access to uh, every store sale, not sales numbers and data. Um, what that means long term, who knows? You know, hopefully just on the service for customers, it doesn't really change anything. Right. But, you know, we just want everybody to be informed so they know what's going on these next few months and just, you know, try to you know, have an open mind, you know, we're kind of dealing with this for the first time too. So, you know, hopefully everything goes smoothly, but you know, you know how that goes. Yeah. Then like another issue this can create for some of the comic book shops is like, there is a, there's an order amount that a shop has to get in with diamond to meet certain discounts. Yeah. And if, you know, DC being probably what 30% maybe of the overall market. Now all of a sudden these comic book shops, they're, their orders with diamond are going to drop 30%. Yeah. And is that going to affect their discount with right. diamond? Yes. You ever see how that shakes out. That's kind of the reality for comic shops. We're looking at smaller discounts on what we're selling and more shipping costs mm-hmm. because now regardless, you're ordering from two companies now. So you're going to have, you know, higher shipping rates, you know, just mm-hmm. in general, you know, regardless of discounts and that kind of thing, just the, you know, physical transportation of this stuff. Which again doesn't sound like a big deal, but again, shipping costs are a big part of you know comic shops' budget. So <laughs> you may get free shipping from Amazon, but that's yeah. uh, <laughs> that's not the way it works for comic shops. Uh, wish we did, but <laughs> not really how it works out. Nope. All right. Well, should we move on to one of our other topics? We didn't even talk yeah. about the order we wanted to do. Well, I tell you what, there hasn't been a lot of comic books coming out lately until just recently, but there has been some new stuff coming out, and DC's been doing a lot of digital releases, and one of them is this Batman: uh, The Adventures Con- Continues. And so this is a uh, book that is first appearing digitally on Comicsology. Uh, as we're recording this, the print issue has just come out of the first issue. And that's kind of the story we're going to be talking about here. Uh, so what this is, is this is a continuation of the animated series continuity, uh, you know, as a comic. Now, the real, you know, reason for this book being is they have done so many of these Batman, the animated series action figures. <laughs> they're starting to run out of characters to do. So they're starting to extrapolate and do new characters in this toy line. So now they're doing this comic to sort of tell the backstory of how these characters fit into the animated series universe. Uh, And so we're seeing some of those new characters introduced here in the book. And I think it's Ty Templeton that's doing the designs for all all these new characters to kind of fit in with that sort of Bruce Timm style. And again, he has a history of doing the Batman Adventures comics, you know, that tie into the previous animated series and that sort of thing. So that's kind of where they're coming from with this. Um so, yeah, so it's Batman, The Adventures Continues, and it's by Alan Burnett and Paul Dini with mm-hmm. uh, Ty Templeton on art. Right. Uh, and I think, yeah, and so this first story is called Hardware. That's correct. And it opens, uh, so this is sort of, if you're, you know, kind of keeping up with Batman, the animated series, this is more like the new Batman Adventures when they brought the show back on Kids WB. And so it's that sort of a newer style, the more streamlined, you know, harder edge, more angular design. And, but they were bringing back here in the book is the title cards from the original Batman, the animated series, which did not carry over to that new series. So, but it's kind of a neat kind of, you know, splash page here for the comics and a good way to introduce the stories here. And it's a fun thing for like longtime fans to kind of see that again. So to just, we want to just kind of do a quick synopsis of the story or um it doesn't matter to me i don't uh whichever way you want to go so it's basically just starts out with 
Batman uh, fighting Bane on a rooftop, and then there's this giant sort of old school robot coming through, kind of tearing up the, the street in Gotham. Uh, this robot really reminds me of uh, sort of a retro, uh, mm. like robot from like say the old Superman Fleischer cartoons, which were a big influence on Batman the animated series originally. Um, so, but, but again, giant robot in Gotham isn't like a typical thing for Batman. Nope. And, uh, while he's fighting this thing, we see this kind of character in the shadows watching him. We're going to find out who that is here in a little bit. Uh, but meanwhile, the uh, robot breaks into a Wayne tech lab mm-hmm. and runs off with a safe. And, you know, as of right now, we don't know what's in the safe. Uh, the, uh, robot throws like a truck at Batman and flies off. Later on, Batman is at a uh, party with hosted by uh, Veronica Vreeland from Batman the Animated Series. And I don't think we ever saw her on the new Batman Adventures, the sort of reboot of the series. Uh, so it's kind of interesting seeing her here in this continuity. And uh, then we have Lex Luthor show up, kind of talking to Bruce Wayne on, at the party and talk, you know, trying to get out of him what the robot stole because it was you know proprietary Wayne tech. And uh, but Lex knowingly says that Superman is not around, Mm -hmm. you know, to stop this thing. And so at the end of the issue, we have Batman tracking down the robot and being captured by Lex Luthor wearing his battle armor, Mm -hmm. which we didn't see until the Justice League cartoon kind of after this. So, you know, if you're kind of putting this in with the timeline, this would be kind of pre Justice League because it's not that version of Batman yet. But here we're getting sort of an introduction to Luthor's battle suit. And so that's sort of the cliffhanger to this first chapter. But again, I thought, was, I thought it was kind of interesting how, you know, kind of jumping back to the very beginning where like Bane is almost like a throwaway character in this story. Yeah, it's, real, it's a real kind of quick thing. The quick thing, I but like, I guess it just introduce as many characters as they can into this particular, uh, well, this particular world. That's the thing. That's a pre-existing version of Bane. I'm surprised they didn't throw somebody else in. Oh, okay. You know, like, cause that is Bane from the new Batman adventures. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't do like a blockbuster or something or, you know, some new character they could make another figure another out of. Another figure out of, yeah. Maybe they just want to, uh, you know, l- you know, give that figure a little bit more action or something like that. Yeah. So, um, uh, I thought, uh, I thought that, uh, I'm kind of flipping through it here. Are, did they, are they doing this as two separate issues or are they doing this at the for hardware as two separate issues or is it going to be just one issue? Cause it's hard- the same cover digitally. Uh, yeah. Hardware should be the f- entire first issue of the print mm-hmm. comic book. Um, so it's kind of split up into two chapters, which is how they pretty much do their digital stuff so they can have it released weekly. Or I think this is bi-weekly actually for this book, but, uh, you know, it's basically half a comic each chapter. And you said this Veronica character was a character from the Batman adventures. Yeah, she, yeah she's like a socialite character from Batman, the animated series that showed up a few times, but I don't think she was ever in the new Batman adventures. Oh, okay. You know, like that this comic is modeled after uh i always enjoy stories where you have bruce wayne going up against lex luther as opposed to batman going up against a powered lex luther i kind of thought you know initially when we were reading this that that's what we were going to get we find out pretty quick that that's not actually kind of the story that we're going to get from this one um but uh i think there's anything else in this first one that i wanted to wanted to mention i don't think it's about it so well, nice cover by Dave Johnson here. And again, a lot of good variants coming up for this series. Uh, I know the first issue has a Dan Mora uh, variant that I really like and a blank. And again, there's a bunch of different store exclusives out there and stuff like that. But we've already seen variants for some of the future issues that are all really nice. I know like Joe Quinones has got one and like Dan Hip has one coming up and stuff. So pretty cool covers. So we want to go on to chapter two. Is there anything else to say about this first part? Uh, I, th- I think I'm good. Mike, you got anything you want to add? Uh, no, I'm, I'm nothing that could uh, really expound on what you guys have said. All right. So going on to chapter two. And again, we've got this title card for hardware part two. And it's cool looking. <laughs> yeah. And again, it's sort of a weird kind of odd shaped, you know, face. You're not sure what's going on, but that, you know, clears up pretty quick into the story here. Mm-hmm. So, you know, kind of cutting back to the cliffhanger, we have Luther kind of choking out Batman here. And now the safe that the robot stole is opening up. And here we have a sort of damaged Brainiac head. Mm-hmm. It's what, you know, the robot stole. So it turns out, you know, Luther 
who I, oh, I guess we should mention you now, has been was controlling the robot, of course. Uh, he's trying to get a hold of Brainiac, you know, through this technology. Uh, Batman throws a battering into the broken Brainiac head and kind of uh, activates it enough to shoot lasers at Luther, knocking him out of this hangar that they're at. Uh, later on, Batman's kind of recovering with Alfred in the Batcave. And he knows he has to have something else to go up against Luther in his battle suit. Yeah, so, so we get the power armor for almost like from Batman v Superman. So yeah, so <laughs> you know, I, I was kind of amazed at just even for Batman how accurate he could be with his batarangs to hit that right. brainiac head just right to shoot the lasers out of the side, <laughs> just <laughs> right to hit Lex. Yeah, they do also mention too that like he had been studying this brainiac head thing too, so he probably do it pretty well. So I'll give him a little bit on that. Uh, but yeah, we've got some real kind of Dark Knight Returns looking armor here in sort of the animated style mm -hmm. that uh, he has and then that actually flies. And so he kind of flies off back to the airfield to track down Luther and actually uh, Luther and Mercy are escaping on a plane. And so Batman flies down to the plane and kind of has sort of an aerial battle here with Luther for a little bit. So Luther jumps back on the plane and now into uh, piloting the robot. And so then the robot destroys the plane and comes after Batman in the sky, um, where we get a nice exchange of Luther saying, you know, sort of through the robot, no way you'll escape Batman. And Batman doing his West best uh, Wayne Campbell says way. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the machine with a uh, kryptonite uh, ray where previously we were told that looking at the schematics of the robot, it looks like there's a second cockpit in it, but what it is is a captured Superman that Luther has been using to power the robot. So when Batman hits the robot with the kryptonite, it awakens Superman and he kind of busts out of the robot, destroying it. And then Superman flies off with Luther and Mercy in tow. Mm. Uh, later on, Batman and Superman are kind of at the wreckage and recover the Brainiac head and Superman takes off with it. And just sort of like a little epilogue here, we have the shadowy character from before out on the street in Gotham with uh, somebody in an apartment upstairs yelling at him down on the street. This character pulls a gun on him, and we realize that this is uh, Jason Todd, you know, red in sort of the Red Hood kind of version from the comics. Minus uh, the Red Hood. <laughs> yeah, no, without the actual mask, just sort of the white streak in his hair. Um, what's interesting about this is Jason Todd was never in uh, Batman the Animated Series. They went from Dick Grayson Robin to a Tim Drake that was sort of an amalgam of Jason Todd and Tim Drake's origin stories. Uh, so Jason Todd has never been in the Animated Series before. So we've got, you know, hopefully an interesting story here as to what happened with that, what his history is. Was he Robin? Is he a Robin that they just haven't talked about? You know, they've never brought up. That could be kind of a weird thing because... We do have a few years gap in between Batman the Animated Series and Batman the New Adventures. Uh, and there was a mini series years ago called Batman the Lost. Like, it was the, the Lost Years, which kind of filled in some of that gap where you have Robin becoming Nightwing and that sort of thing. Uh, but I don't think they really addressed Jason Todd in that. But presumably it would kind of be in there, maybe, as far as the timeline of all this goes. Uh, and so that's the end of the first issue worth a story here in this series. You know, the first time when I first seen uh, the white streak in Jason Todd's hair, the name Jason Blood came up in my mind. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, that's that's the same type of white streak, just mm -hmm. a little bit with the red hair. Of course, Jason Todd started out with red hair. So. Yeah, well, Morrison addressed that during his run at one point with that his version of the Red Hood in there. They right. kind of backed off from that. <laughs> well we do see that in the the second issue of this series we're going to get deathstroke and the, yeah. and i know that at least the third digital issue is out is the fourth digital issue the fourth, come the out, fourth yet? Is out the fourth chapter is out now too okay. so again maybe we'll talk about those you know at a later time a later date yeah now, and what? i guess we can assume that we're going to have jason todd as like an underlying backstory until it it comes to yeah. uh comes to a head with him and in, in some later oh, is this gonna be like six Six issues, is that what this is supposed to be? I think so. Okay. I'd have to check one of the old previews, though, to be sure, but that sounds about right. Okay, so it may be a little bit for that fully that storyline fully resolved. Yeah, but, I mean, it will resolve. They're making a Red Hood figure, spoiler alert. <laughs> so, <laughs> surprise, so, like, surprise. We are going to get 
Jason Todd Red Hood by the end of this. Um, yeah, so I mean, I liked it. Uh, yeah. It's kind of fun, kind of getting some new stories set in the animated series universe. Uh, there was, um, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, Batman Adventures comics that kind of were doing this sort of thing back in the day. Uh, there was that first series with Mike Perlbeck that was really good. There was, um, there was a, they brought back another Batman Adventures. There was Gotham Knights kind of in between. And then there was the uh, Batman Adventures they did later on, probably. Uh, actually, this might be the one that Mike Gatchson and me were talking about the other day, where I think it's maybe around 2003 or so. But um, that was set during more like, it's sort of the Justice League design of Batman in that book. But that was a really good run that, wasn't that long. I don't think it was even 20 issues, but it had a free comic book day starter kind of for the first issue. And that was a really good run. If you can find those, those are all worth reading. There are so many like uh, people who, because of Batman, the animated series that became Batman fans. Yeah. So, and this is definitely a, a good book for, you know, a younger reader uh, who is, who's into Batman or might want to be into yeah. Batman to pick up and read and, and uh, there'll be several more of this series that are going to be available over yeah. the, the coming yep. months. Or if you're just a fan yeah. of the animated series, this is worth yeah. kind of jumping back into, you know. I find this style, and I'm kind of new to this. I've never, I may have writ, uh, read uh, an issue or two of the uh, Justice League uh, animated series, uh, but this is very accessible. I, I, yeah. I enjoyed it. I like the uh, Silver Age tone to it. Um, it's something I'd keep reading. Yeah. No, uh, there's been some really good, especially Batman animated comic books over the years. Like, again, that first volume, Mike Proudbeck drew, that, was, that series started off really strong. Those first few issues are still really good, and I think they're reprinting the first issue of that right now to kind of coincide with this book. Uh, but, yeah, like, Batman animated, the animated series, the cartoon series, was just such a great touchstone, and, like, it's one of those things for my generation where, like, even guys and girls that didn't read comics would watch that show after school mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was really just sort of like a real kind of mainstream kind of thing back then that, you know, led to all this other stuff that we have now. You know, so many spinoff series from this and the DC animated DVDs basically come out of that same, you know, kind of group and everything. So it's got a really good legacy there with all that stuff. Does anybody, you guys want to rate this one or give it a grade? Oh. Uh, I'd go like very fine, you know, yeah. definitely a good read. And, and it's like, so I like it cause it's a, be a good intro pointer, you know, yeah. for a younger reader. So, yeah, I think I'd go very fine too. Again, kind of bringing back Batman, the animated series. Uh, there's no baggage here. You know, if you haven't seen Batman, the animated series, I feel like this is a pretty good intro issue. You know, I mean, most people know what Batman is. You know, so there's not a lot to this issue. But, you know, it's a good, fun read. Mike, you got a grade for it? Uh, I'd say, I mean, sheer enjoyment value, probably very fine minus, maybe very fine. Uh, just because it's not sophisticated is what I have normally read. But that's but you like Silver point. Age. But it's not supposed to be sophisticated. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, I'm sort of contradicting myself. <laughs> Uh, I not the it's not the great coupon of comics that Atchison is used yeah, to. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. There's not much that does that meets my expectations anymore. But I, I, uh, I enjoyed it for what it was worth. Yeah, and I'll keep. I would keep reading stuff like that. I mean, does it have that that big? Um, oh, this is a big event type feel to it. Uh, it it's not intended to, and it doesn't. But that doesn't make it uh, bad. I'd, so I'd say very fine minus, just to be different than you guys. All right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, man, it's been so long now since I got these. Uh, so digital price point, what was it? Ninety nine cents a chapter. Ninety nine cents a right? chapter. Yeah. Okay. So again, not not gonna kill you mm -mm. on your pocketbook right now either. So, but again, come into the store and get the physical copy when it comes out because they got some cool covers on there and some variants to get. Is the physical copy not out yet? It comes out. It comes out today. Okay, as we're recording. I thought it was already on the shelf. I thought I saw no. it there. Okay. I mean, it should have been like everything right. else. Right. You know, <laughs> we talked about it in the previous a while back. You know, I think probably right before everything hit. But uh, yeah. So uh, going from one kind of, you know, 
movie, cartoon sort of thing? Do we want to talk about movie casting? Sure. So kind of keeping, kind of going back to what we did a few months ago. God, how, how long has it been now? Here, <laughs> been you talk and, and I'll figure it out. So uh, just to kind of get everybody back up to speed, uh, they are supposed to be producing a new Gods movie with uh, Ava DuVernay and Tom King. Uh, so a few episodes ago, we kind of looked at uh, sort of our ideas, our sort of fan casting ideas for a uh, new Gods movie. February 24th episode. Well, I forgot the episode number already. Episode 62. Okay. So go back to that. If you want to hear our uh, new Gods take mm-hmm. on this casting, so are the good guys of this. And so now we're going to go over our apocalypse casting, you know, sort of the bad guys, presumably for the film. And again, none of this is official. This is just us kind of throwing out theories who we'd like to see. Wait, what? That sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> you guys told me I get to pick. Right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so go back and listen to that first part if you want to hear our uh, takes on the other side of this. But now we're going to... We're we were meant to do this a while back, but of course, everything going on, we're just not getting to it. Mike, did you were were you on the episode where we did the picks for the new gods? You weren't, were you? No, I yeah, wasn't. Do you, before I we Tyler, get into the back, Tyler was. Tyler was do we, before we get into that, are there any that you want to uh, that you want to throw out on the new gods? I know you didn't prepare for it, so I will. I don't. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, there. I mean, I'm, I'm not good at just coming up coming up with some. Uh, I. I know the voices that I hear when I read these comics. I, I kind of know the feel of your Scott Freeze and your maybe your High Father and and Orion and and Light Ray, but I I have to actually research. I don't have quite the range of experience on uh, movies and TV shows that some people do. So uh, I, I but it would have been fun, I, but that was the most enjoyment I have had in a while was researching um, actors and actresses uh, for the apocalypse side of the equation. Of that anti-life equation. (laughs) That's right. That's right. So do we just want to list the character and everybody kind of goes around and says they're picked? Do we want to do it like that? Sounds sounds good to me. Okay. So do we want to start with the big one or do we want to end with that? Uh, It's your call. All right, let's choice. Okay, let's start with uh, Desaad. Okay, all right. So who's going first? One of you guys go first, because I just recently thought of this like an hour ago. I finally got came up with this, and I want to make sure one of you guys didn't tell me this previously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I've got two names for Desaad. Okay. All right, so the first one, I was trying to remember the, uh, the character he played in the show, but the first uh, character, his name is Bern Gorman. Um, he was in The Expanse is like one of my favorite like sci-fi shows that's on Amazon Prime right now. And he basically kind of played the, I don't know, the bad guy, I guess, in the latest season um, of The Expanse. I definitely think he has the right look. Um, my other choice for this character um, is Brad Dorif. Okay, uh, that's, that's was, also my pick. Okay, that's all right. Where, that's where so I got then, that. <laughs> all right. Well, I don't, I don't know if I told you this before okay. or not, so... Um, we may just be thinking similar, so I will let you expound on Brad Dorif then. Okay, so I was really racking my brain on this one. I came up with a couple guys at first. I'm like, no, not them. I, I just felt like there was somebody else, and I was really kind of going back. And like as we were talking about recording this episode, I'm like, oh, I got to figure this out, you know, because he's kind of the one that I really kind of left hanging. Um, but yeah, I just I kept thinking like there's somebody that's just like right there. I'm just not thinking of it. And so as I kind of look, you know, kind of looking at some of these different parts, I'm like, it really kind of makes sense. My main thing was kind of his portrayal of the doctor on Deadwood is kind of what I was thinking. But then there's also like his performance in Child's Play back in the day. And I, again, I, that. I think I think the big thing that people are going to point to for him with this will be playing Grima Wormtongue oh, in the Lord mm-hmm. of the Rings movies. So, again, I think what's his name? Brad Dorf. D O U R I F, I believe. Is that, yeah. It's hard for me to remember that right off, but I think yeah. I can spell it. He was also in a really good episode. He had a he had a one off episode in uh, Babylon Five too that I had yeah. I really remember. So, but yeah, I think an actor who has done all these different roles could play decide pretty well. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so, but yeah, you might be what gave me the idea there. I just <laughs> I took a roundabout way of subconsciously getting to it. All right. Who'd you have? Mike for Desaad. Uh, 
Well, before I say, I want to comment on both of yours. That Burn Gorman, I've never, maybe I have seen him before, but that is one creepy looking dude. <laughs> <laughs> he could pull it off. And then Brad Dorif, I he looks like he's got that edge to him as well. So I'll definitely take your word for it. Uh, my pick, I was just thinking, oh, what's okay. That? I'm just, I'm just not also looking up Burn Gorman. I didn't know his name. Yeah, that guy's a great pick. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Pacific Rim and some different things. Yeah, that guy. That, yeah. How do you know all these things? Jeez. I watch man. movies, man. I'm going to sit in a dark room all day like you are. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I, no, I mean, he's a character actor I've seen in several yeah, things. Yeah, lots of things. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, he's a good pick, too. So you'll notice that most of my picks are from the same, like, five movies or TV shows. They're, like, the same things. I've. It's my limited experience in, in <laughs> viewing television or movies. My pick is a guy named Michael Emerson. Does that ring a bell for any of you? The name does, but I can't picture him. Yeah. He, if you were a Lost fan, he played Benjamin Linus. Yeah. He was the conniving, oh, yeah, genius, yeah. scheming guy. And then he was um, in that just, show with he was in the show with Jim Caviezel. Um, uh, at Person of Interest, was that what it was? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. I I really liked him as an actor. He was just one of those guys you love to hate. Uh, and he just to me would give him some of those weird curls on the forehead. Those bangs, you know, he would have. He has the right demeanor, the right attitude, the right image for a Dasad. Just not really physical, but just nasty. Okay. So he also played. He also was the voice actor uh, for Joker in yeah. Batman: Dark Knight Returns, parts one and two. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I haven't seen any of, the, any of the live action stuff with him. I think, but I yeah, I remember him being in Dark Knight Returns. With that so next uh granny goodness granny goodness all right dan you go first okay so i've got katie seagal for granny goodness Jeez. and again i'm not thinking peg bundy here right as much as i'm thinking Gemma from sons of anarchy and kind of that what she did with that character so that she's my pick for granny goodness on here i thought you were going to go ed asner Man, you know what? I, it's just felt <laughs> like I would, but I feel like that's just a cop out because he's played the character so many times. And I, I would love a live action Ed Asner as Granny Goodness. And you know, he's got he's got love for DC in the comics world. Uh, you know, he was on Doom Patrol, and you know, just follow him online. He you know really appreciates comic art and that kind of thing. So I'd love him to be in there somewhere. But I feel like yeah, I just felt like I'd be a cop out. <laughs> Uh, well, my top choice for Granny Goodness is Sigourney Weaver. Oh. And then I would follow that up with, and this one is, I think is a little bit more obvious, uh, would be Kathy Bates. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> 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 so, but I think Sigourney, I think Sigourney Weaver would be my first choice that, for that. That'd character. be a good pick too, I think. Mm -hmm. Mr. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, my first thought was Kathy Bates, but it was because I figured everybody would think of Kathy Bates. I went with a woman named Ann Down, or Dowd, I'm sorry. Um, she plays Aunt Lydia on The Handmaid's Tale, uh, that Hulu series. Uh, uh, it's, I hate to have, I don't need to go into the series, I guess, but she plays a very um, matriarch, matriarch type that is, uh, Tries it's very much like Granny Goodness. Tries to put off that she's the caring uh, aunt, and she's but at the same time she's brutal to the uh, subjects, with, which are the handmaids. And these handmaids, and if you know the the backdrop to that that series, is it's a dystopic future where uh, the country has been taken over by um, fundamentalists that think that they have to uh, that there's no they can't procreate anymore because of some nuclear d disaster. And the few women that are left that are fertile are um, basically taken hostage and made into handmaids. Um, so just have to look up and out. And uh, I recommend that TV show very much. Yeah, I don't think I've seen her in anything, but she definitely looks the part looking her up here. Yeah, she's definitely, you know, has some good acting creds as well. So, yeah. So uh, next up, uh, Calabac. Calabac. Is it my turn to go first? Yeah. All right. So, I, okay. So I've got two again for Calabac. I think my first choice is going to be, and I'm going to butcher this guy's name something terrible. Liev Schreiber. Schreiber. He played, yeah, he played uh, Sabretooth 
Right. Um, and Ray, so. Ray yeah. Okay. There you go. So I haven't watched Ray Donovan, yeah. but uh, and then my my other choice for Calabac is uh, Casper Crump. He was Tarzan in the like the most recent Tarzan oh, film. I never did. I kept meaning to see that. Never did. So I think he might be good also because of you know the you the physicality that you would right. expect out of those roles. And I know and we know with uh, okay, help me again on that name, Dan. Leif Schreiber. Leif Schreiber. Leif okay. Um. You know, we know that he has the capability to do that physicality too, just from the playing saber tooth. So uh, I don't know who I would. You know, we have this thing where it's like almost every single Marvel actor is, is like going to end up right. being a DC movie and vice versa. So maybe this is his chance to do that as well. But uh, so I don't know who I would pick top out of those two. But uh, those are the first two that that I come up with for that. Yeah, for that that pool cool of actors who haven't been in a Marvel or DC movie is <laughs> constantly dwindling. Mm-hmm. You know, we're starting to see more and more crossover with that. So I don't think that's the end of the world. And again, this is our casting who we would want in these parts. Uh, so uh, I might catch some slack for this, but just uh, this sort of fan casting on my end on this one uh, gets sort of wrestler heavy as we go along. <laughs> so this is going to be my first wrestler on the list. And but, so not picking, your, but not your last. Not my last. <laughs> uh, so I'm picking uh, wrestler Braun Strowman to play Calabac, who is a big brute of a guy. Uh, I think physically he really kind of looks the part. And again, you know, you're talking about costuming and, you know, whatever else to kind of buff these guys up, you know, make them look big. You know, we've got some pretty crazy kind of concepts and characters going here with a, you know, fourth world movie. So, but yeah, I think he's a, I think he would be a good pick for that. And not all of these characters have to have like major parts, right? So he, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't get a, you, you're not going to get a movie with all the characters we're listing here, and they're all main characters, right? So exactly. Be cameos and kind of background things, <laughs> which you know sounds like that new Batman movie might be, but everybody, might be. oh it. gosh. So, Mike, Calabac, right? Yes. yes. Rory McCann he played the Hound on Game of Thrones. He's uh oh okay. He's got that demeanor that exudes hatred, just like Calabac, but it's more of the brooding type. I mean, Calabac's more, I mean, he's just more fierce and wild and crazy. Uh, but I couldn't pass up on this guy because he he's just a mean sob and he's very <laughs> loyal to uh, his character in Game of Thrones uh, was um. Uh, I just I think it it matched up what uh, I envisioned a Calabac would be being loyal to Darkseid. That's not a bad choice. All right, so now uh, I guess Steppenwolf, Darkseid's Steppenwolf. a wolf. Yep. Uh, well, on Steppenwolf, since we've already had an actor uh, play that in the Justice League movie, his name was what Syrian Hines. Mm-hmm. I just left that one alone. Like, you know, because he didn't really act in that movie, <laughs> you know, it was really just like he would just kind of CGI it around. So I just left him. Okay. You know, he's, he's there already. Let's not break that continuity. Let's let's keep him around. So, well, I'm all about breaking that continuity <laughs> and having someone who can actually act in the part. Uh, he gets a chance to act. So we don't know if he can act or not. <laughs> we, saw what he, we saw what he did. Uh, so uh, for my Steppenwolf, I'm going with Jeffrey Wright. From uh, the Daniel Craig Bond movies and uh, Westworld and Boardwalk Empire. And I believe he has been cast as Commissioner Gordon in the new Batman movie. But I'm going to pick him here, you know, until that happens. <laughs> it's like all these names, I recognize the names, but it's right. like I have to. I feel like I have to look them up. Just yeah, to... and I'm grabbing a bunch of character actors and stuff like that for some of my stuff. So I'm sure it'll happen. But again, I think he's a good actor. I think he can pull it off. Hey, I, you know, I'm sick of movies where they just get the flavor of the month right. actors and they can't act. They're just like, I'm, I'm tired of Jason Momoa. You know, I just think, you know, and it's just like, give me some people who can act and get a good director and a good story and just give us a good film. And the movies oh, will yeah. take care of themselves. For sure. So, yeah, well, he's he, a, act, he, he acted really well in Game of Thrones because he didn't have any speaking parts. <laughs> he just had to be big. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. So it's like, yeah, I've been, all, yeah. He's he's he was solid. I enjoyed him in the first season of Westworld. So, yeah. uh, so Mike, who's your pick? 
Uh, going, going back to the Game of Thrones, well, uh, a guy <laughs> named Christopher Hivu. He's a Norwegian actor. He played Tormund Giantsbane um, uh, from the North. He was the King of the North's uh, right hand man, the big redheaded guy. Oh, with, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, he's a great, he was a great character. He's got the military leadership style, kind of the wild imposing look that Steppenwolf. I mean, you're right about what we've seen of Steppenwolf in the in the movie, Justice League movie. All you've seen was the helmet and, you know, the aura about him. There was no there was no acting involved, whereas this guy, I think, could could pull it off. He could pull um, off Calabac, too. He could. I, I tell you what, I switched these, <laughs> him and the, the hound back and forth a few times. Mm-hmm. But he's big. Uh, he's got this mean stare to him. So, yeah, that, that's that's who I picked. Okay. Uh, going on to Kanto, dark side sort of assassin. Okay. Uh, who wants to go first? I'll go first this time. This uh, guy, you're probably not going to go know his name or know him either. His name is uh, Jean Dujardin. He's a French actor who um, he played uh, the Swiss banker in The Wolf of Wall Street with Brad Pitt or with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. And uh, he won a, an Oscar in 2012 for the movie The Artist. Oh, yeah, he's OK. He's got that he's got that European. Um, uh, what the, what's the word I'm looking for? He just has that uh, way to him that he's you know if you if you know much about the Canto character, he's based on um, an Italian Renaissance character uh, because he was like exiled there for stealing something back on Apocalypse, and he was sent back to the past on Earth, and he got trained in uh, being an assassin uh, in Renaissance era Italy. So I've seen, I really like that movie Wolf of Wall Street, and I just this guy struck me as the uh, uh, the right character, the right actor for that role. Okay, uh, so for my pick, I've got uh, Ray McKinnon. So sort of another character actor. Uh, he played the preacher on Deadwood, and he's been in Sons of Anarchy and uh, Mayans and stuff like that. And I just feel like he he seems to really commit to some weird characters. <laughs> that he plays and so i feel like you know again kind of going with the backstory that you know mike just kind of went into i feel like he's a guy that would re- really kind of throw himself into this part and i think he could really pull it off uh, okay so this is my only i think I, I probably should double check my list this is my only game of thrones actors that i have in any of these things because that so far them acting in other things they've generally disappointed me so this is a very minor character uh, C.C. Smith, he was Arya's swordmaster in the Uh-oh. first season of Game of Thrones. So he obviously has the skill set and I think the look to pull off this character. I, I enjoyed him in that role, so he'd be playing a very similar role. So not to, you know, stereotype him into just playing swordsman or that type of assassin type character, but uh, um, I felt like he'd be a good fit. So his character in, in the book was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember his name, but it was uh, sort of an exotic name as well because yeah, he came, from, you know, across the water. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that that's a good pick. <laughs> okay. All right, so who's next? So I think next we'll do uh, Mantis. Mantis, or the energy vampire of yep. Apocalypse. You go first, Mike. Uh. Mantis, I have uh, a guy named Matt Jones picked, uh, mostly because of the way he looks. And he was a pretty good actor, too. He played Badger from Breaking Bad. He was a uh, oh, okay. buddy <laughs> that uh, was slamming dope all the time. It was right. little, one of his right-hand dealers. Right. But, but the way Badger looks with those wide-set eyes being bug-like, and right. he's got this kind of a horse voice, man. And I could just see him being... Um, an alien creature right uh, i'm sure he's more versatile than just that that one role that he played in breaking bad but uh right. but you know one thing i didn't realize i read up on it but mantis is supposedly the second most powerful being mm-hmm. on apocalypse right after dark side Outside. because he, mm-hmm. he's that energy vampire thing so yeah uh, i i i thought that'd be pretty cool yeah, i think that's a good uh, yeah that's somebody i would not have thought of for that part <laughs> but yeah <laughs> I think that's an interesting pick uh, so again, this was one I totally forgot about until right before we started recording. But uh, I'm gonna go with Timothy V. Murphy. Again, another character actor. Uh, 
I know he was on Sons of Anarchy. I know I've seen him in something else recently, but I just can't place it right now. But again, just plays like a bastard. <laughs> you know, just a mean guy. Uh, yeah, I, I know there's something more recent he's done, but I'm just not, I'm just blanking on it right now. But yeah, I think he'd be a good pick for that character. And again, for, I mean, realistically, probably a character that's not going to have a huge part in it either. But right. I think, you know, he can do some good with that. Well, I went back to the Marvel well for Mantis, and just because I'm assuming that he's not going to get to play Wolverine again at some point in the future, he might be looking for something to do. So why don't we just uh, line up Hugh Jackman for uh, for this role? <laughs> he's a good I actor. Take... Uh, yeah, he's a good actor, and that's I I you know I'm trying to pick actors, good actors over you know <laughs> even their how closely they resemble the characters. Um, cause the, you know, they can do the CGI and they can do the, you know, special effects, the makeup to, to get them the look that they want to have. So, so that's my pick for Mantis. Okay. Two good choices. I like them. Okay. So, uh, let's go into these characters, are, you know, are bound to be in a movie somewhere with all this. It's probably the female furies. furies. I can't see them not including them in a movie at this point. Uh, so we want to start with them. I will start with Lashina. Okay. Uh, I'm. I just put Kate Beckinsale. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's kind of speaks for itself with that. I know it's probably not the most creative casting, but that was my pick. I actually have three for Lashina. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so my first one is Jessica Henwick. She played Colleen Wing in Iron Fist. Oh. So oh. I thought that her character and Misty Knight were the highlight of that series, as bad as it was. Um, so I felt like it'd be nice to give her a chance to, uh, to act in something yeah. else. Now, this one is absolutely stolen. Um, and this is somebody that you should not have heard of. If you're going to, if you've heard of this person, um, I had not heard of this person before I did some research today. Um, DJ Rostenberg, she was the stunt duddle for Jessica Jones, for Kristen Ritter and Jessica Jones. So she, and she's apparently up on all of her martial arts and fighting and stuff like that. So I feel like that'd be good to, they would have to rely less on special effects right. uh, for that character. And then my Marvel crossover character is Chloe Bennett, who played Quake and plays Quake and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I, that's a weak choice. So that'd be further down on the that's list. For the, that's for the female Fury's TV show. Yeah. <laughs> that the CW end up doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike? My choice uh, was Laura Prepon. Oh, yeah. Played, uh, <laughs> yeah, she played Alex on Orange is the New Back and played Donna in that 70s show. New she's show. got she's got a real dry sense to her. She's got a deep voice. I don't know. I I, I don't know what Lashina would sound like or, or, <laughs> or much more than what I've seen in the comics, which isn't a whole lot. She's not one of the prominent Furies, I don't think. Mm. And it's you don't really get to see much of her face anyway because it's all Covered right. with straps or lashes or whatever, but I always liked uh, Laura Prepon's uh, look, so um, that's that's why I picked her. All right, so next is uh, Stampa. Stampa, like I had a cop out for this one. Okay, just go to go to the. Uh... I got a song called Stampa. Oh. <laughs> I was like, what in the world is that? <laughs> I should have queued it up. Yeah. I go to the uh, strongest woman in the world competition for oh, that yeah. year and take the winner and ask her to play Stompa. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm kind of going back to the wrestling well here, and uh, I'm going to pick uh, Nia Jax. She is a wrestler. She is uh, related to the gigantic Samoan family that is <laughs> – you know, in wrestling, uh, she's cousins of uh, The Rock and wow. I think Roman Reigns and some different wrestlers. Uh, again, she definitely has the build for it. I feel like that'd be a good part for her in here. Mike? I, uh, this is one where I had two choices and I, right to this minute, I still haven't made up my mind. So. It was both of them. The Game of Thrones choice is <laughs> Gwendolyn Christie. She played Brienne of Tarth. I'm gonna veto that one. She's six foot three. Why? Why didn't you like her? 
she, you know, watching her in, in Game of Thrones, it's like it's like when she has the armor on, it's like she can barely walk. <laughs> you know, and I just she was completely unbelievable as a like this warrior. You know, I just yeah. uh, I couldn't buy it. So. <laughs> All right. Well, that's that's why I have two two uh, options. Yeah. And... <laughs> my veto doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. This well, my <laughs> up until a few minutes ago, I thought this was real. I mean, come on. Uh, my my second choice, or maybe my first, was Gina Carano from American Gladiators oh, and The yeah. Mandalorian. Um, she's not as big as Brienne of Tarth, but she's got she's got the physicality. She's she's, she's definitely more physical. Yeah. yeah, I think you can throw a costume on her or do some camera tricks with the size. I don't think that's the big, a big deal. Yeah, she was she was my big Barda, one of my big Barda choices. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's. Yeah, and I don't know anything about wrestling. I just knew at one point, whenever I had picked my, uh, did my fan casting back in Utah, I knew I had picked a wrestler, and I couldn't find her again. No. So I had to find another wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, somebody like that. Okay, so after that, we've got Mad Harriet. And so I'm, I think, I think this is my last wrestler. Okay. <laughs> But, um, I don't want to hear anybody give me crap about picking too many games of Thrones. <laughs> well, I'm not picking any, as far as I know. I never watched it. Uh, so I'm going with uh, the wrestler Asuka on here, and that's A-S-U-K-A. Um, she is a wrestler from Japan they brought over a few years ago who's very physical, just kind of throws herself into her persona on wrestling. And again, I don't know that this probably isn't going to be the biggest part in this movie, but I think she'd be good for that role. Okay. Well, my Mad Harriet is uh, Dina Mayer, of course, from Starship Troopers and Dragonheart and uh, lots of other stuff. Uh, I just I, she's just one of those uh, actresses that I just generally like anything that she's in. So, um, so yeah, that's who I came up with, Mad Harriet. It's Dina Dina Meyer or Mayer? Yeah, M E Y E R. Yeah. yeah, like yeah, she you know, looks familiar. Yeah, she, I mean, she got the red. Well, you know, in her earlier acting days, she had this really, really thick red hair. Um, so she has a, 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 a she was like, I mean, she's had lots of other parts. Like she was like a, a extra on Friends for like Joey's boy, girlfriend for several uh, um, right. episodes and stuff like that. So she's been in lots of different stuff. She's got a lot of. Uh, uh, film credits. I was. We're watching Monk. She was just in an episode of Monk, not too, yeah. <laughs> that I just watched not too long ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. My choice for Mad Harriet is Sophia Boutella. She's a French slash Algerian actor slash dancer, and she played Gazelle in the Kingsman, the Secret Service movie. You know the oh, yeah. the right hand woman of uh, Valentine right. part, and she had those. Uh, those, you know, those prosthetic legs that right. were also razor sharp or whatever. <laughs> and she has that look about her like she's just crazy, like Matt Harriet, but also very, very uh, formidable. So, uh, yeah, that, that's how I came up with her. Okay, so uh, Black Racer. Black Racer. <laughs> Okay, mine's dumb. Well, it's not dumb, but the reason why I chose it is... We'll, we'll be the judge of that. Okay, all right. So, for my Black Racer, and because I, I, picked, uh, I picked this guy as a possible uh, Mr. Miracle as well, but I've got Michael B. Jordan. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I picked Michael B. Jordan is they could do a Creed movie where he's in the ring and gets paralyzed, and then that could tie the Creed movies into the DC Universe movies. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you're right. That, that is a dumb choice. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but I like Michael B. Jordan as an actor, so um, that's another reason to pick him besides that. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, for my black racer, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce this guy's name, but it's Harold Heronew, I'm guessing. You can't pick him if you can't pronounce him. No, I did. <laughs> he was Is he in, a wrestler too? No, no, no. He's, <laughs> okay. he's a character actor. He was in Constantine when I was on. Uh, he was. Oh. Uh, on, um, I think was, was he the Voodoo Gabriel. guy? No, not him. No? Uh, he was like Gabriel, the angel that comes. Oh, to the that's right. He What's was his a, name? 
He's Harold Perineu. I think it's P-E-R-R-I-N-E-A-U. If you're playing along at home, um, he was also he was in Sons of Anarchy. He's done. Oh, some, he was in Lost. He was Michael uh, in okay. Lost. Yeah. Okay. He was who in Lost? Whoa, 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 Michael. Whoa, whoa. The dad of the oh, kid yeah. had. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. So, I never watched Lost either, so. <laughs> well. I forgot he was in the Matrix. Huh, okay. Michael. Michael Dawson. Yep. Good That's one. Good pick. That's a good pick. Mike, who's your pick? All right, I'm breaking the mold. I'm breaking the gender barrier for Black oh, Racer. You gotta have a lot of fans upset. You heard it here first. <laughs> uh, Samira Wiley. Uh, she's also an alumni from Orange is the New Black. Um and also, she plays a, a character named Mora in Handmaid's Tale. Uh, she's got sort of a short crop hair, um, tough as nails, very good actress. Uh, you'd have to look her up. You might recognize her um, from Orange. I don't know if you've watched either one of those series, but um, S-I-M-I-R-A Wiley. Yeah, I'm just kind of like, I don't think I've seen anything she's done now that we're talking about it. Uh, she's she's got some pretty good cred though, um, Not and I just thought that would be a good one to to break. I mean, because the right. it's just it's a, I mean, really, honestly, it just seems like it would be a. Yeah, I didn't want. I mean, I was sitting there thinking, who are some of the African American actors or actresses that, right. and I'm like, well, let's just just break out of the whole male uh, gender for that character. Um, so right. that, that's my pick. Okay, so I think we're getting down to it. Uh, yeah. Let's see. What we got left Sleaze and Glorious Godfrey and Vermin. Well, guys, do you guys have people pick for those? I, I threw some names in. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so let's go to Vermin Vunderbar next. <laughs> uh, again, sort of a smaller character, but somebody that could be, you know, in the background or maybe in a couple <clears throat> scenes. Uh, so for this, I picked Mads Mikkelsen. I think he'd be a good choice for that. I had him for Metron as a possibility. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think when you brought him up last time, I was kind of already thinking about him for this. I just looked up Max Mickelson and it comes up as a poet. I guess no, Mads. M A D S. Oh, M A D S. Okay. Yeah. Now he was in a Casino Royale. The and guy with the weeping yep. eye. In a, uh, Doctor Strange. Yep. I know he is now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this was, uh, let's see, where are we at here? Um, oh, okay. So, uh, I just, you know, came up with this one right before we started recording. First person who popped in my mind, uh, for Vermin Vunderbar, and that's David Tennant. So, um, he was so good as Purple Man, you know, I, I, plus I enjoyed his run on Doctor Who. So, uh, you gotta get him in there someplace. So, this was a good fit. It was kind of... Those guys kind of look alike, David Tennant and that Mads guy. Got that same angular look to their face. He's got very sharp features, I guess. Yeah. 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 Mike, did you have anybody you want to throw out for that one? or? I Yeah, my last minute pick when we oh, okay. before we went on the air, I was, uh, I, I was thinking, okay, who would have that woman wonderball sound to his voice? And I thought of Brad Pitt in Inglorious Bastards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. So hey, that, that's one of the a. That's probably the only A-list actor on my list. <laughs> right. I just I just came up with another one, uh, <laughs> Timothy Dalton because of his portrayal as the bad guy in The Rocketeer. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, and the bad guy in uh, Hot Fuzz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who's the German actor that was in um, Django? Uh, oh, Christoph Waltz. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He'd be a good pick for that too. Yeah. Uh, so Sleaze, sort of a later yes. character. Uh, if you're a fan of Superman, you know, a pretty notorious story that he was in. Yeah. In the 80s. Uh, again, this is a character that, you know. Not an original, uh, a yeah, no, not from like back in the day with the Kirby books, but, you know, probably a character that's going to be portrayed through some combination of animatronics and CG, uh, sort of thing. So I think for me, probably the voice is probably the big part here for this character. Uh, my initial reaction, you know, my initial thought was Danny DeVito. 
<laughs> but I'm like, eh, he's kind of done that thing before. So I'm going with his uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia co-star Charlie Day, I think, would be a good pick. And it'd be a little bit of a stretch for him. It's, you know, not playing a likable kind of doofy character. I think just more of a scumbag sort of villain character for him. Well, mine was a last minute uh, pick again, because we, again, this is a character we hadn't initially talked about doing, but anytime I think of CGI and acting, the first actor that pops into my head, Andy Serkis. So, oh, yeah. yeah, so might as well just let him keep that string going. <laughs> <laughs> just be one more. He can add to his list. Right. I didn't have anybody for him. Okay. Please. Uh, I think my last one I had that's kind of an outlier like that would be Funky Flashman. All right. Um, now, I think I already brought him this guy up on a previous episode. I think uh, actually when Brian Morris was on, and he I knocked out a Royal Flush Gang real quick. But again, this is a different part. Wouldn't be as makeup heavy as I think Royal Flush Gang would be. So I'm going to go with Sam Rockwell for this part. I think that's a character he could pull off really well, is really kind of in his wheelhouse as this sort of fast-talking mm-hmm. shyster sort of character. Yeah. It was funny in the Mr. Miracle Limit series Tom that Colin King did that they made that a much more positive character yeah. than the character was actually intended to be. <laughs> yeah. It's always felt sort of like a dig at Stan Lee. Yeah, well, I almost I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was kind of a big surprise in that run. And again, with Tom King being involved with the movie, that's probably closer to what we would get, you know. That's true. Um Let's see. Oh, Glorious Godfrey was the other one. Um, and again, you know, Mike brought up before we started recording that, you know, kind of his big party had in Legends. And so that's kind of my take on the character as a sort of media mouthpiece for Apocalypse on Earth, sort of infiltrating kind of subtly through media, which, again, is a big thing these days. You know, I think you could really do a lot with a character like that right now in a film. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going with comedian Anthony Jeselnik for that part. Uh, just sort of, you know, sort of shock comedian, but I think he could really pull that part off well. Uh, he, you know, had a show he kind of got in trouble for a few years ago and things like that that he had on Comedy Central. So I think he's a good pick for this uh, part. Well, I'm going to go with on Glorious Godfrey. I'm going to go ahead and go with this one. We talked about this before, but I'm going to pick Jim Caviezel primarily just because of the fact that uh, since he played Jesus in Passion of the Christ, that for a lot of people seeing him in a that type of a role that is so contrary to um, his previous role, uh, that it, it might just be enough to really push that character kind of over the top a little bit. So, um, yeah, it was the first one I thought of, and I'm, I'm just going to stick with it, so... I can't come up with anybody for Funky Flashman, though. So, right. Mike, did you have anything you wanted to add on those? Or good? No, I'm good. Okay. That's fine. So I guess we got to get to the big one. Uh, you know, oh, our, yeah. our main villain for the movie that they kind of dropped the ball on in Justice League uh, is Darkseid, the ruler of Apocalypse. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? Um, all right. So I am going to go with Clancy Brown. So oh. his voice, uh, basically from the Highlander movies as the Kurgan, um, he's a bigger guy. Uh, he's obviously a little bit older now, but I can't imagine they're going to have him doing major action fight scenes. Right. Um, but uh, I just, I, he's a, a great actor. He's been in lots of good stuff. Um <laughs> course it might be odd note for people knowing that he's also the voice of spongebob right <laughs> <laughs> but uh that he was you know he was the guy first guy popped in my head and i'm just gonna kind of stick with him yeah no i think that's a good pick and again you know dc connections with him being lex luther you know the superman animated series and being you know and he was on the flash real quick back in the day you know on the on the you know newer show okay i so, forgot about him being on that yeah um and you know, Mandalorian more recently, and I'm you know, you know, more physical kind of role there mm-hmm. that first season. Uh, so yeah, again, uh, I'm assuming this is going to be a lot of prosthetic CGI. Uh, doesn't matter as much as who's in it as as much as the voice on this one. Uh, I think I think my pick could do both, uh, but I'm going to go with Kevin Grievous from uh, Underworld. 
and he's also the creator of the I Frankenstein movie from a few years ago, and he's written some comics off and on over the years and things like that. But he just has a super deep, really imposing voice. Um, again, just look him up on YouTube. Watch any kind of interview with him. Uh, it's just it sounds like a joke. His voice <laughs> is just so deep and crazy sounding. It's just like it sounds like they're modulating him, but they're not. And you know he kind of jokes around about it, you know. Uh, but I just think he's and he is a big guy. I think he's got a good build, you know, just to be the part two. But yeah, I just I feel like that's kind of the voice of Dark Side there. All right, Mike, it's up to you. I was just looking up Kevin Grevio or however you pronounce yeah, it. G- yeah. It's G-R-E-V-I-O-U-X. <laughs> yeah. And really, really got to just watch an interview with him just to hear him just talking in uh, quite a normal dialogue. Because anything you see him in a movie, you're thinking, oh, that's that's modulated or he's putting it on or something. But like that is his actual voice. All right. Yeah. All right. So my pick is Jeff Bridges. What? <laughs> Yeah, the dude. Uh, that is my high father. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're counterparts, and Jeff Bridges has that craggy face, and he's right. Uh, he he can look mean as hell, and he's uh, yeah. I I did just he he come across to me as a a good dark side. Um, and he's another you know, Marvel DC car transfer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was you know when you think about. Thanos being a an analog originally he was they, he was a copy off of Darkseid and uh, you got Josh Brolin playing him who's the son of a famous actor James Brolin and then you got Jeff Bridges it's the son of um, Lloyd Bridges, Lloyd Bridges. Right. yeah just, there seemed like some sort of uh, uh, providence that was involved mm-hmm. in my choice there I just came up with it and, yeah so Jeff Bridges the dude all right. So I think that's everybody. I think that's everybody. Yeah, that we planned about, planned to talk about, and some more. <laughs> yeah, I think we had some good picks in there. Uh, let us know what you think of these. You know, mm-hmm. we're always looking for input on the show. That was a lot of fun. Or let you us know. Post what in the uh, the Facebook group we have for the podcast now. Yeah. Let's search for Campus Comics Cast on Facebook and. When you see episode 68, just put it in the comments. What our obvious failure to to realize was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's some. I'm sure there's some obvious ones we're missing. I know. I'm right uh, and you know, sorry to Tyler. <laughs> I know he worked pretty hard on this, and he's not here with us as we're recording this right now. So he was might. supposed to send you his list. Did he not do it? I don't know. Oh, uh, okay. You know, maybe on a few draft episode or something. We, we can, we can let him sneak one in. Yeah. yeah, Mike, if you want to work, if you want to spend, you know, 24, 48 hours working on a new God side, you know, then you can. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I will, too. <laughs> I'm curious. You guys pull these things out of your back pocket. like Wrap, wrap these up. <laughs> well, are we ready to so. celebrate the 80th anniversary of Robin? Yeah, I think so. So, again, we've, you know, kind of done this a few times this year with Wonder Woman and Flash and different characters. So it is the 80th anniversary of Robin this year. Uh, so we thought we'd all talk about like a good Robin story to kind of recommend to everybody. Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> Robin's been around you know, for 80 years now. Uh, so does anybody want to go first or anybody just dying to talk about their Robin story? <laughs> uh, let me go first. Let me okay, go. Because I, I wrote my thoughts out this afternoon. All right. When I was supposed to be working. <laughs> <laughs> so i'm i'm a little bit at a disadvantage uh because i don't have my comic collection here so i had to kind of go by memory and i i uh i remembered i, I mean really 80 percent probably of the robin stories i've read were part of the new teen titans and then it dawned on me um the uncanny x-men new teen titans crossover from 1982 it was it was my one of my favorite books of all time for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was my favorite Marvel DC crossover, but it was my real introduction to Chris Claremont. And aside from a random comic here and there, uh, my introduction really to Walt Simonson as well. Uh, and it really, to me, Walt at his at his best. Um, so it was uh, it, it was a story that obviously wasn't Robin centric, uh, with so many other characters in it. But it, it did show off Robin's strengths as, as a team leader. I mean, he never lets you uh, doubt for a minute that he's in charge. 
I know, you know, you still had, you know, Professor X, of course, on the X-Men side, but Robin was the field leader. And when you can pull that off in a pair of green Speedos and pixie boots, <laughs> right. and the reader's still like, oh, this guy's, he's kick butt, man. I like, you know, as, even though what I was uh, probably 15 at the time or 16, um, I was just, it was just stuck with me as my, a, a great story. And I've read it a couple, three times since then. Probably the last time was uh, two or three years ago. Um, both both those teams are at the height of their popularity. Um, and the story really, when you think about it, classifies as an event. Uh, three years before Secret Wars or Crisis on Infinite Earths either one came out. Right. I mean, this was a big deal. Um, you had the villains were Dark Phoenix and Dark Side as the uh, nearly omnipot- omnipotent, omnipotent villains. Um, but the roster they had were just as strong and they were able to combine their forces and, you know, and, and prevail. Um, and something else that I, I didn't realize until now when I'm researching this and, and, uh, is that at the time dark side, wasn't a premier DC villain. He wasn't, you know, he was in the fourth world. He maybe had a few justice league appearances, but this predates the Great Darkness saga in Legion of Superheroes by a couple of years. And this was the first time that Darkseid really came to prominence as the premier DC villain. Um, and a, a little piece of trivia, this is also the first time the source wall was shown visually. It was referred to, you know, in all of Kirby's comics. Um, but never did you see, you know, what we all know very well now is that wall in space of all of the giants that are just pasted up against it, defending anybody that tries to, to breach it. Um, so I hope that this choice wasn't really like a cop out, but it's really, it's my experience with Robin um, was more of a team leader, um, not so much as the sidekick, not so much as a solo player, um, you know? And uh, so, yeah, that's a, his role in the Teen Titans is really what is uh, embedded in my mind. And, and as a part of history, I was I was really on a Robin kick this afternoon. Um, you know, he he's not the first sidekick. He's the first teenage sidekick. You know, you had a lot of uh, uh, adult sidekicks that predated him. Well, not a lot, but a few. You couldn't have been a lot because he came he premi- or he uh, debuted in 1940. But um, you know, but after he came out, there the sidekicks, the teen sidekicks came out of the woodwork like Bucky oh, yeah. and. Sandy, you know, Sandman's sidekick and Speedy and all that, and Toro. Uh, so he really did start a trend. And to be honest, if he, if I don't think Batman would have lasted terribly long if Robin hadn't joined that no. cast oh, no. uh, as early as he did. Yeah, people like to deride the character, but it's like he's, you know, he serves a function within the story of, you know, someone for Batman to interact with and not just be inner monologues all the time, you know, and he brings a lot, yeah. of, he brings a lot to the stories. I want to show you guys something. I know it doesn't, it doesn't show up in a podcast <laughs> in <the> audio <laughs> format, but I picked this up. Can you see Ooh, this? Oh, is that, is that my birthday present, Mike? That is, <laughs> that, is. that is the second appearance of Robin in a solo story. Uh, it's, he started a solo run that lasted five years in Star Spangled Comics. Yeah. And uh, this is the 19, this is number 66 from 1947 and and i could not pass this up uh it was a good deal and that's a good um, find oh my gosh and um now now i'm like all stuck on robin so um, <laughs> yeah. yeah no that's a well you know what star spangled comics also leads to for robin right well i mean well just in sort of took over well in sort of, in sort of the real world is uh Robin is the golden age character to appear on the most covers because of star spangled comics. Oh yeah. Because he, Oh, he appeared on every cover that Batman did. Yeah. And, world's and finest world's detective. World's finest. Yeah. Yeah. And he also had his own book, his solo stories in star spangled. So he is the character that was on the most covers back then. Nice piece because of, of that. That's yeah. A good there, yeah. And, um, so the star spangled, appearances i think have only been reprinted in uh some a couple of robin archives back yeah. when they were doing that and it wasn't the whole run either i think there's just two volumes of that i've got the first one but yeah i don't think it, those stories have really been reprinted since then either 
So, and they don't show up very often either, just on the back issue market, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, I was I was excited to see this, and uh, I did not realize he was uh, for five years the the star character. Now he wasn't the last year or so. I think he lost the cover yeah. slot to Tomahawk, but he was, still had stories. Yeah. So, yep. So yeah, again, just sort of a forgotten sort of era of Robin that not a lot of people know about anymore. Right, right. Everybody thinks when they think of Solo Robin, well, I say everybody, everybody my age. You think about Hudson University whenever he split right. off from Batman, went to college. Yeah. That's all, you know, in the backup features in Detective or whatever it was. Um, but, yeah, for in the Golden Age, he had five years of it. Mm-hmm. So that's my piece. All right. Scott, do you want to do yours? Or? Uh, sure, because mine won't take too terribly long, I don't think. Okay. So um, I picked uh, the Judas Contract. Okay. Uh, you know, primarily because this is one of the first times and maybe even maybe even the first time where you have one of these sidekick characters who then takes on an identity of their own. So this is in Tales of the Teen Titans, 42, 43, 44, and then Annual 3, um, Marv Wolfman, George Perez. So that's, you know, at the height of their, um, you know, popularity in that title. I guess that was DC's best selling title, you yeah. know, at the time or if not close to being their best selling best selling title. And here in, uh, well, we get this, you know, we have the great Deathstroke and has Terra infiltrate the the Titans. And and through the course of this story, um, Robin, Dick Grayson, takes on a new identity. So he becomes a Nightwing. Uh, so it kind of, he becomes his, I guess, like I, maybe his own man is, I guess, one way to describe it. Uh, he's going to stop being, trying to be just under Batman's shadow and, and again, become his own character. Um, but this is just, you know, whatever I, you know, whenever I was thinking of a, a Robin story, I had two stories that popped into my mind and it's always, anytime I hear of a, anything related to Batman, of course, it always goes back to the dark Knight returns. I thought, well, I could throw that one out there cause we got, you know, the first female Robin, but, um, this one, uh, with just the introduction of Nightwing and plus the strength of the story, this is why that story is why Deathstroke is as popular of a character as he is. Um, but again, the introduction of Dick Grayson as Nightwing and it starts a whole new chapter for that, for that character. All right. Well, kind of going off of that, my pick is, uh, Batman number 416. And this is after year one, sort of, uh, pre, uh, 10 nights of the beast, you know, kind of leading into the death of Robin, you know, Jason Todd Robin. So this is post-crisis. This is a story with Nightwing, uh, sort of shortly after he becomes Nightwing. And this is so this is still sort of disco, big collar era Nightwing, that original costume. <laughs> and so uh, I'd have to go back and do a lot of rereading. But post-crisis, anyway, this is the first time Dick Grayson meets Jason Todd, you know, as the new Robin, sort of as his replacement. Uh, so this is a story called... Uh, White, Gold, and Truth, and this is by is written by Jim Starlin with uh, Jim Aparo and Mike DiCarlo on art, and so it starts out with Jason Todd uh, kind of trying to bust a coke lab on his own, and uh, Nightwing comes to, you know, he just sort of, sort of shows up at the same place to kind of do the same thing. Turns out he's been keeping an eye on these guys, and Jason Todd has really kind of dropped the ball and tried to bust up these guys before they have any product there. So they can't really, you know, the cops can't arrest them for anything necessarily. And, night, you know, he kind of screws up Nightwing's investigation into these guys. Um, but Jason Todd doesn't know who this guy is, kind of bossing him around. And uh, Dick Grayson kind of leaves and tells him to talk to Bruce, which is a hint to Jason Todd that this guy knows who Batman is. Uh, so he goes back to the Batcave and him and Batman kind of have a back and forth. Uh, again, this is just sort of a weird period for Batman being very antisocial with others, even the people in his that are real close in his life like this. Uh, this kind of continues up until Tim Drake comes into the picture later. Uh, but yeah, it's just kind of a good story, kind of, and it's sort of uh, this is the uh, Jason, this is the uh, sort of homeless hubcap stealing Jason Todd. This isn't the pre-crisis where it's just a sort of carbon copy of Dick Grayson. Right. And so this is kind of, it's sort of a primer on kind of Dick Grayson's history. 
I feel like they fudge a little bit of the circumstances of him leaving and becoming Nightwing and that sort of thing and being involved with the Teen Titans. This uh, is probably housekeeping on their part after Crisis on Infinite Earths. Uh, but it's a kind of a fun story, just kind of going back and forth. Dick comes back to the Batcave and kind of confronts Batman, too. I like it as far as that, but it really is kind of the start of what we got post-Crisis with Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson's relationship, where it's just about always adversarial. And everybody wanted to write Batman and Robin not getting along. But cumulatively, it really takes a toll on their relationship, I think, in that continuity. Because you have this Robin who is constantly at odds with Batman, even in flashbacks. And so it comes down to, like, well, what was so wrong with Jason Todd if the first guy was doing all this? You know, so that was kind of something I didn't like they were doing back then. But this is kind of the first instance of it, so it doesn't stand out as much. But then at the end, we've got uh, Nightwing and Jason Todd Robin kind of teaming back up to take the guys down later on that they were you know, going after originally. And so it's just sort of a cool story. And I don't think anybody ever really talks about it, but it is sort of a fun, you know, generational Robin story, you know, and kind of Dick Grayson kind of realizing, hey, there's a new, another one now. What's the deal with this guy? You know, and Jason Todd kind of learning about Dick Grayson, you know, the original Robin. Uh, I read this. I read this story a couple of years or a couple months ago, Dan. Yeah. Uh, I think I picked it up just because I was one. It, it is like one issue, right? It's the yeah. issue before the uh, the Ten Nights of the Beast started. Yeah, sort of a. I, I, I was struck by that cover by Paro. That was man. That is a great cover. Yeah. I picked yeah. it up in the seat bins. I know, but it was. I mean, it was a good story. I I, re, yeah. I remember really well. Yeah, and the thing on that cover too. That's a Paro with Wilson Kevich inking over him. And not just like they go together better than you think they would on this cover, mm-hmm. you know. And well, uh, that was back before Sinkevich got a little crazy anyway on his. Yeah, on his and, style. The, and there's there's a little bit of that in here, but you know you can definitely tell this is Jim Afaro on here. And I was, you know, I got mine signed by Jim Starlin a few years ago at a convention too, so that's <laughs> kind of nice for that. But yeah, again, just sort of a good Jason Todd story too, because post crisis you don't have a lot of that. You know, before they killed them off in Death in the Family. Right. So, Mike, did you have any alternate uh, Robin stories you were considering? Not to go into details, but just just things you were considering throwing out there? Uh, there was a Batman family story where he married um, Batgirl. Uh, I can't remember the issue, and I didn't have time to... Is, that guy, is, she, is she on the cover in a wedding dress? Yeah, yeah, and he's in, like, an orange tux. I mean, it's a oh, yeah, yeah. Robin-themed tuxedo. <laughs> and I just I just remember that story. Uh, so, yeah, that was that was one of them. Uh, but other than that, no, I, it was all the Teen Titans. I would have probably picked something like Judas Contract or the Trigon, you know, um, storyline or Brother Blood. He's just a good team leader i think what about you dan yeah i mean i really wanted to go with a tim drake story on this because that's sort of my robin uh right when i got into comics is when tim drake was becoming robin so i was kind of like right along for that i I was getting into comics as he was starting to be robin so uh i mean if i was going to pick anything else it probably would have been a lonely place of dying where he comes in there's those great george perez covers on that um you know he's He's the one that's the detective. He's the one that figured out that Bruce Wayne is Batman, you know, and said, hey, I want to be a part of this. Uh, I mean, he had a solo book, too, for so long. I know there's some good stuff in that, but I probably would go with that. Or um, I can't think of the name of the story now. I know it was in Detective, probably around 1990-ish. Uh, but it's when uh, they do, it's with uh, the Obia Man. And uh, he kills Tim Drake's uh, mother and cripples his father in that story. And he had a big villain, you know, for that character that they've never really brought back since. I've always wondered why they haven't brought him back at some point. But, uh, yeah, I probably would have gone with one of those, just being of the generation where Tim Drake is my Robin sort of thing. <laughs> hmm. so I, I had also, a couple. Go ahead. Just real quick, I just thought of this, too, was uh, in his solo Red Robin book that Fabian... Nicieza. Nicieza. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, wrote there was some good story. That was a good run in there too, and there was some stories of uh, sort of a uh, sort of like a, a challenge with assassins coming to town, all going after one target. That I think he might have done a couple times, or might have been in a Batman book too. 
But again, just sort of a cool story that I always think would be a good movie or like something they should continue in the comics kind of going forward and every now and then have this story where all these assassins come to Gotham for like one night, you know, after a target. You mean different than Batman Begins? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think it's, pro- it's probably more like the Arkham Origins game. Oh, okay. How they did that. <laughs> well, like, a couple others that I had considered uh, was, uh, I think it's Batman 655, the first Damian Wayne issue. Oh, yeah. Uh, Primarily just because I got that recently and haven't read it yet. No. <laughs> um, I also oh, yeah, thought the, it, the Batman and Son story, right? Yeah, yeah. Then I thought the um, the Morrison uh, Batman and Robin series because then you have the Dick Grayson Batman with the Damian Wayne uh, Robin, uh, and then and then another one was the Tom King run on uh, Grayson. So because there you have. Yeah, you know, him post-Robin, post-Nightwing, that was a time when he was supposed to be dead. Right. You know, or I guess one of the times that he was supposed to be dead uh, might be, uh, might, would probably be a good selection. And then, um, has the 80th anniversary issue come out yet? Has it shipped yet? Yeah, it shipped kind of before everything shut down. Okay. It's been All out right. for a while now. It's got a good, it's got nice Lee Weeks regular cover on it. Mm-hmm. And there are like, what, 10 Robin stories in that book? So yeah, if you're that, looking that for a Robin awesome. story pretty yeah. rare for uh you know what some of these anniversary issues have been there's a lot going on in that one yeah i wouldn't normally buy that one i bought the flash one i bought the wonder woman whatever all those anniversaries but the only reason i bought a copy is because i collect the issues that have the um the a character bursting through a papered hoop <laughs> <laughs> like black canary or, or robin and detective 38 which right I have, of course i got the effects in uh and then they had one of the variant covers was uh, Robin. Uh, right. Person. Was that the Jim Lee one? Yes, I think so, yeah. It's it's weird, isn't it, how Jim Lee keeps popping up as a cover artist on all these anniversary issues? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> like he's got some sort of uh, uh, actual cool, like see Detective yeah. 1000, he gets to do all these. Yeah, what's up with that? Coincidence. Okay, can I say someone? Well, I want to say one thing about Tim Drake now. That name that they, you know, that Brian Bendis gave him, mm-hmm. Drake, is yeah. the stupidest thing I've. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a Drake is a duck. Yeah, and, and it's his real name. Yeah. And it's, okay, I get it. I mean, but it's like Naomi. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Well, the, Naomi's fine, but it's almost like they wanted to have a bird theme name, and they go, "Oh my gosh, I forgot his last name's Drake, and that's a duck, and a duck is a bird." And I'm yeah. Like, it's it's a cool. Duck. <laughs> they um. Yeah, I think in uh. <laughs> have stuck with Red Robin. So. Yeah, I know. I think they, uh, in the last issue of Young Justice that came out before everything hit, uh, I think Spoiler shows back up in there, and she kind of makes fun of his new costume. And again, I've given that costume a chance. It still has not grown on me. Yeah. I just, I don't, I feel like it was designed by another artist, and the artists doing this book aren't really pulling it off that well. Um, but again, I'm, I'm just going to take that as a sign that this identity won't be around for very long. I'm hoping we get something else. Again, you know, if you want to come up with something new, you know, sort of a Nightwing version for Tim Drake, I'd be fine with that at this point. It's just, you know, I don't think they really know what to do with the character anymore. I really don't like Damien. They can call him Batmite. <laughs> uh, give Tim Drake the Robin name again. Um, I mean, there there is sort of been a thing since the character's been around, too, where there's been this idea of, and they came it came up again in Detective recently, of someday Tim Drake will walk away from this. He will retire and live a normal life. I think that's even the thing in um, Kingdom Come. I think in the back matter of Kingdom Come, it, you know, at some point there's a thing. Yeah. He's working for the CIA now. He's not a superhero. Right. You know, and then on uh, Batman Beyond, he becomes, you know, he's sort of retired, living a normal life. That's not all there is to it, spoilers, but, you know... I think he's he's one of these characters where they've always said, like, he will walk away from this someday. Maybe it's just time to do that until somebody comes up with a better concept for this character. Right. You know? Well, in um, in the de- recent uh, detective run, well, not uh, fairly recent, um, yeah. by Tyne in the fourth, he was, there was like the, spoiler for those issues, there was this future version of Batman that comes back in time, mm-hmm. and it's Tim Drake as yeah. Batman. Yeah, yeah so... And again, that goes back to like Jeff Johns Teen Titans run too, is where they kind of introduced that concept. Yeah. The thing with that too was uh, back in Teen Titans, he used the gun, and it was the 
gun that uh, shot down the lanes originally that he was using. But then when they brought it back in detective, the artist drew it some other way. So they had to feed in some dot line of dialogue explaining why the gun looks different now. <laughs> yeah, I thought Batman uh, melted that down and put it into his bat symbol plate. On yeah. Uh, Kevin Smith came up with that afterwards. <laughs> hey, Dan, I got the uh, the Suicide Squad number five. Uh, we'll talk about that later. All right. <laughs> we'll talk about that afterwards. All right. Oh, that's, that could be a whole episode. <laughs> so are we done? I think so. Anybody else got anything to bring up? Uh, I think I'm good. I'm okay. good, too. All right, so, Scott, yeah. where can everybody find you online? All, all right. Well, you can find me at uh, birdcomics.com, B-U-R-G comics.com, and on Facebook and Instagram and uh, my eBay store, stores.ebay.com slash birdcomics. Hey, Mike, if some old friends want to get a get in touch with you, <laughs> they can they can call my phone number uh, on the rotary phone. <laughs> if he wants to talk to you, he, you yeah. already have his number. Oh, <laughs> right. No, Mike okay. Atchison Five is the only open format social media I have. I've got okay. Facebook, but you have to go through the uh, the Campus Comics site to get to me. Um, but I would, I'm sure I would, if somebody did reach out, it would be drawn to my attention, and and uh, I could talk to you. Okay. And I'm Dan Brown. I'm on- online at Detective651 on Twitter, Instagram, and on my T Public store where uh, we're having a sale right now with uh, t shirts and masks and all kinds of fun stuff. And you can also find me Saturdays at Campus Comics. And, you know, we are open again now. So come down to 816 East Main Street, Suite B in Carbondale, Illinois. Uh, we're open Tuesday through Saturday, 11 to 6. Uh, phone number 618. 618- four five seven six zero one one or you can find us on facebook or twitter so i think that's it for this time uh thanks everybody for listening and mike atchison yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to unmute his mic.